Uh, Mr. President, I move that private members' business item number 889 be considered in a short form format. The question is out of the member. All those in favour say aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. I move the motion. Continue on. Uh, Mr. President, there are a great deal of concerns with the new intercity fleet. The South Korean trains have been fraught with problems from the beginning. The Liberal and National Government disregarded New South Wales manufacturers, instead choosing to build trains offshore, sending both taxpayers' money and jobs overseas. They rewar rewarded an overseas tenderer, claiming they were cheaper than our local manufacturers. We have now seen the fleet's costs skyrocket by more than a billion dollars. The Berejiklian government's decision-making has led to problem after problem, empty promises, trains that were too wide for the tunnels and too long for the railway stations, a grave lack of appropriate consultation and a complete and utter failure to del deliver the trains on time. The most troubling issues are the significant safety concerns, especially the impact that this could have on our residents. The public has a right to know about these and how they are being addressed. 90 per cent of transport workers surveyed about the fleet said that they would not staff the fleet when it comes into service based on their safety concerns. The operating model of the South Korean trains was designed to be driver only, and now the Berejiklian government will remove guards from these train services. They have shifted some of their safety responsibilities onto the drivers, who are unable to undertake the much needed work that protects commuters and vulnerable community members. The government has proposed a new position with a lower classification called customer service guard, who are not permitted to perform any of the critical safety functions of train guards. The transport minister met with Martin Stewart, who was the 2018 Blind Australian of the Year, who lost his right arm and leg after he was dragged beneath a Melbourne train for 200 metres. The train did not have a guard to help him alert the driver when he fell. The transport minister stood next to Martin and publicly promised guards would be maintained in their current roles. On October 2018, he said, and I quote, I can assure Martin today and the people of New South Wales that under my watch, our new intercity trains will not be driver only as was being considered. Guards perform an important function on our railway, ensuring the safe op operation of the rail network. They also go above and beyond to assist less abled passengers to board and disembark our trains. The minister has now broken his promise as there will be no guards performing this work. Design flaws mean that there will be no guards standing at the crew cab door to assess the platform for fall risks or see people falling into the, cra the tracks. Customer service guards will be locked in the crew cab without audio and won't be able to hear cries for help. There will be no mandated visual inspections of platforms, no hazard searches on trains. Passengers cannot seek assistance from a guard in emergencies, just a button directed to a remote call centre. Mr President, the order for papers is much needed as the fleet has been shrouded in secrecy. In fact, the Berejiklian government have been forcing stakeholders, including disability groups, into signing non-disclosure agreements. What is this government hiding? Preventing community groups and testing crews from speaking about serious safety concerns means the government is actively trying to deprive the public of essential information that they are entitled to. Under the Rail Safety National Law, the operator must consult with unions regarding the introduction or variation of a safety management system. Alarmingly, the government has failed to meet its obligations on this. In October, it was reported that the fleet is delayed yet again. The fleet was already delayed for more than one year. The government had falsely promised services would begin in late 2019. Here we are in 2020, and it appears it's likely to be delayed until 2021. We do not have enough information on the implication of the design flaws, safety issues, train delays, and blowouts in costs. The public has a right to know they should not be kept in the dark when it is their taxpayers' dollars that have been spent overseas on South Korean trains that pose many safety risks to the public. Mr. President, this call for papers is necessary for us 
to try and see through all those issues, as I say, shrouded in mystery, shrouded in secrecy. It's a call for papers that the government should agree with so we can get on scrutinising just, just what's gone wrong with this whole fiasco of the South Korean train purchase. Thank you. Uh, the Minister. Gosh, it's great when we've got uh, um, union rips in this place. Yes. So he's straight out. You know, he comes in here with his union rip on, with, uh, hat on. We want, we want, we're going to have a, a list of demands. And the list of demands looks like this. Looks like this, a, a page full of documented requirements that, uh, in fact, the union, the union uh, uh, leader over here wants the, the government to provide to his members. Really, this document epitomises everything that is wrong with what you do and how you, in fact, approach these standing order 52s. The scope of this document is so wide, is so wide as to, in fact, just be, it, it, defy credibility. We, we, want, we want this. Operation manuals and all documents and correspondence regarding the operation of instruction manuals. We want all documents, all correspondence, all communications, all reports relating to contract designs. We want all documents, all correspondence, all communication, all reports, all minutes relating to any consultation with any disability groups and agencies, work groups, community groups. Not limited to anything else, we want all this since 2014. Since 2005, we want all these documents. No attempt to come and negotiate what we actually want to see. No attempt. And in fact, when the government approached uh, those opposites, can we get the scope sort of uh, limited? No response. We will, we, we, we will use uh, and take advantage of. We will take advantage of. We will take advantage of the opportunity uh, afforded now by the motion which was passed early today to try and limit the scope of this. But this, uh, this Standing Order 52 is potentially worse than any other Standing Order 52 application made to this House. Um, these orders can require staff to potentially engage in 850 hours to actually comply with the order. Since 2019, Transport for New South Wales has spent over 7,000 hours working exclusively on standing orders. This is equivalent to at least four or five full-time public servants working exclusively on res responding to orders for papers for just over a year without exercising any legal entitlements. Mr President, I'm advised that Transport New South anticipates that this order, this order, currently before the House, will take Transport for New South Wales 600 hours at a cost, expected cost of some $200,000. The, 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 the motion uh, currently before the House is a disgrace. Any other members seeking the call at all? The Honourable Matthew Mason Cox. Mr Assistant President, I have, I have just come in and, and listened to the impassioned speech from the Leader of the House and, and dare I say it, I, I have had just a brief look at this motion. And it is quite extraordinary. It's uh, everything, oh. everything from 2014. It is quite extraordinary. And, and look, I suppose this will be the first candidate for the new sessional order. There's no doubt about that, uh, Mr. Assistant President. There'd be no doubt about that whatsoever. And I thank the Honourable uh, uh, David Shoebridge for bringing that uh, to the House for the rest of this session because this qualifies on so many fronts. It really is an outrageous abuse of the power. I um, mean, I have always been a strong advocate of the use of Standing Order 52 to hold the executive account in this place, but this is just extraordinary. Everything from 2014, you can think, you can imagine. Uh, I can't imagine what they're going to do with it because it's going to be going to the Mooki Wing, and uh, the Mooki Wing will be just, just gushing, gushing documents as they, they the semi-trailers head down from uh, Transport for New South Wales. And uh, they come in the gates here and they'll be unloading them for days into the Mookie Wing. And fr quite frankly, uh, Mr Assistant President, the budget, you know, no doubt has to, has to actually find some funding for the Mookie Wing. And that means we don't have funding for a whole range of things in New South Wales that are much more worthy than this vexatious use of the Standing Order 52 power. So, uh, look, I, I strongly, strongly uh, request members to consider this and look at each of the 
each of the long list of documents here down to subsection P. I mean, thank goodness we've got 26 letters in the alphabet, otherwise we would have been in a lot of trouble, Mr Assistant President. It is really an abuse of the power and, quite frankly, I think the comments from the Leader of the House understate how uh, outrageous this situation is. I must say that uh, we have here, uh, dare I say it, uh, Greg Donnelly. Where is he, Greg Donnelly? Where is the Honourable Greg Donnelly? He's a very sensible man, isn't he? He's a very sensible man and he had a few things to say and I'm glad the Leader of the House has brought this to my attention. And I quote the Honourable Greg Donnelly uh, on the 24th of September 2009. I think it's worthy of reflection in this place at this time. It is important to understand that this motion goes to the heart of the government's objection to call for papers. Members cast their net as far as they can to see what can be hauled in and then express confected umbrage when the government indicates it thinks that it's a little unreasonable. Interestingly, in most cases, there is no discussion with the government and no due respect paid to the Office of Ministers and the staff in foreshadowing these issues. The government is fitted up with these motions at relatively short notice. There is no background discussion or attempt to see whether there is a preparedness to deal with the issues and reach some settled resolution about obtaining information. It is a case of go in there, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Remember that, the Honourable Mick Veach is remembering that David Bowie song, Suffragette City. I know he is. The member's time has expired. Oh. Thank you. I might defer to ladies first, so the government whip. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, earlier tonight, I, I uh, raised uh, about the fact that um, we have 15 SO52s on the notice paper today, um, and the government has many times allowed SO50 or supports SO52s through formal business. Um, there are means to make amendments to ensure that uh, papers are produced, but this motion is. Uh, not only is it um, onerous on, as a task for our, our um, departments, uh, and we've heard it talk about the Mookie Room, but the reality is we've got to start being realistic in what we're asking departments and officers to produce. Now, as it said, we've got uh, subsection A to P, uh, which uh, asks for all documents. That's all forms of communications, which means it's going to be capturing emails that are not even directly relevant. And I might note that those officers are constantly talking about ministers being directly re relevant in question time. Here we are asking for documents that are not going to be relevant to the topic. It is going to be huge amounts of time and money and resources being spent. And I'd like to actually refer to advice that the Solicitor General uh, and uh, Anna Mitchell Moy said in 2014, which has tabled in the House previously and provides that it's reasonable to query or dispute an order that refers to a subject matter that is so broad and so unwieldy as to create a great practical difficulties upon compliance. And that's what this is. We're asking uh, for, I'm sure it's probably 21 days, 28 days, so 28 days, an extra couple of days. It is a huge ask, huge ask on a department, on staff and on resources, resources that should be better spent. And, you know, as I said before, the government on many occasions are keen to be transparent, produce documents um, and also come to the table to say, well, where can we be a little bit more realistic? And I actually ask members of this chamber to start thinking realistically what we're asking <coughs> departments and staff and, and financially of our government to be able to produce. Um, and this is just an <coughs> onerous task. Here, here. Thank you. The Honourable Taylor Martin. Thank you, Mr Assistant President. I rise to oppose the order of papers proposed by the Honourable Mark Buttigie in regards uh, to the new train sets. And this motion requests an excessive list of documents so that the member can go on a fishing expedition through the papers uh, that relate to the new intercity fleet of trains that are currently being tested and will soon begin regular passenger service. And I encourage the honourable member to actually catch one of these new trains and go on a real life fishing expedition up the Hawkesbury River, perhaps to Wanderbine Station on Mullet Creek, when they begin rolling out on the Central Coast Newcastle line very soon. The facts in relation to these trains are well established and I do not see the need for anything further. The trains will replace the much-loved and comfortable V-sets that have served members of the public well for 50 years, but are approaching the end of their serviceable life. They will also facilitate the transfer of the H-sets 
off to the suburban networks, and these trains were ordered by the last government and will surely not be missed by commuters. With the two by three seat layout and the uncomfortable seats were dreaded by those who travel long distances each and every day. These trains truly were never fit for purpose. I, I was fortunate to visit the mock-up for the new intercity fleet back in 2018 uh, with the Transport Minister and also with the Government Whip in the other place, the member for Terrigal, Adam Crouch. And I have also seen that the community was being consulted on the setup of the new carriages. The new state-of-the-art fleet of new intercity trains will have USB charging, comfortable two-by-two -two seats, luggage storage and accessible toilets. What else could this order of papers possibly show than what is already relevant and available in the public domain? We already know that the winning contractor was some $575 million cheaper than the next higher, highest bidder. Uh, given the Labor Party's refusal to consider international bidders for supply of carriages, they would have paid at least $575 million more at a minimum for these train sets. Probably more, considering that the tender would have been even less competitive should those circumstances have arisen. Given the extensive information on the public record about this $2.4 billion investment on the new, in the new carriages, I implore all members to oppose this motion. Thank you. Is there any other member seeking the call at all? No one else? The Honourable Mark Buttigy in reply. Look, thanks for, uh, thanks for the contribution, but uh, same old tide oil arguments, same old tide rebuttals. Order! Mr President, every single time, almost without fail, the same arguments get trotted out. Too much, too wide a net, it's going to cost too much. I tell you what, these trains... Minister Constance argued that they were 25 per cent cheaper. You know how much they've blown out by? And you've got the temerity to talk about us asking for papers to scrutinise the cost blowouts. One billion dollars of taxpayers' money. And, Mr President, these people have got the hide to talk to us about costs, admin costs, for papers to scrutinise their operations and their maladministration. The Leader of the House talks about me representing unions. Well, I'll tell you what, you can say that day and night every minute I wear it as a proud badge. But let me tell you a few of the stories. Let me tell oh, you order, the stories, Minister. Minister, about real people who have had issues with this and have tried to get information out of the government. This is not just about the unions, this is about real people. I'll, I'll quote when my daughter was three years old. She missed the step onto the train and fell through the gap, yelling to the train guard. They ceased movement until my daughter was pulled out safely and returned to us. These are with train guards. In May 2017, Emily, pregnant with her first child, fell as she was stepping onto the train at Redfern. Her stomach stopped her from slipping between the rail and the platform. The guard was the first on the scene after hearing her cry for help and providing first aid assistance. Thankfully, both Emily and her baby are OK. A toddler fell between the train and the platform. Several passengers climbed down and rescued the child by crawling between the train and the platform, collecting the child and carrying them back. Guards were able to help this process. Now, you want to tell me that your minister gets up next to this bloke who's had this accident down in Victoria and tells them that these won't be driver-only trains, we'll put guards in. Then you turn around and say, we're going to have these customer service people locked in cabins, looking at monitors with no audio, and that's a safe thing. And you have the temerity to tell us that we can't call for papers. And every time we say all documents in one sentence, you say that's a catch-all. But when we're surgical and we specify exactly what we want, you don't like it. Not one of those points were rebutted on their merits. Same old platitudes. You're asking for too much. It costs too much. We don't want to be scrutinised. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll keep scrutinising you. We'll ask for the papers and will use the power of this House to scrutinise you uphill and down, Dale, because that's what you deserve. OK. The qu Order, please. The question is that of the motion of the Honourable Mark Buttigie. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against? Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Doors. Not yet. <laughs> I wish. I reckon I'm doing your job. Damien I know you did. It's, as someone said, I can't even give them away. <laughs> Lock the doors. <laughs> the uh, question is that the motion be agreed to. Would the ayes please stand? I appoint as tellers for the eyes the opposition whip and deputy opposition whip.
Scripture 500. <laughs> what is it? A thousand. How many steps are we supposed to have? 10,000. 10,000. Ten, that's right. 10,000 steps up today. <laughs> I manage about 8,000 most days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Particularly when I'm at home. Uh, would the eyes please resume your seats? Would the nose please stand? Oh. I only know about Sean Gladwell. I point as tellers for the nose, the government whip and deputy government whip. in the chair, I can't remember it. <laughs> 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 you'll be pleased to know I'm not calling one on mine, as long as it's amended. Oh, on, no, no, not when I'm moving. When I'm my first no, 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 Robert would like to know some more things, and I'd be happy to accommodate them. Yes, uh, no. Um, I had, they have 24 7 eh? Count those sitting again. Had a few more confusions the other tonight. Museum trust in the in the Asian Pacific. It'll be amazing. He's such a team player. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever meet anyone like you, Walt, in my whole life. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's good. It's very good. One you know Craig's an arse. One Walt's an arse and one last time. Oh, I'm a great fan of it. Like to be resolved in the affirmative unlock the doors the clerk will read the order of the day